Hey, Kindred, how are you? You guys, I am so excited. I get to see you. I get to actually see you and be with you tonight. Um, as much as masks were necessary, and I'm thankful that they kept uh, us and others safe and they enabled us to gather selfishly, I cannot tell you how nice it is to look out and not see a sea of masks. That is so fun for me, and so I'm excited to get to teach tonight. Um, and I'll also now really be able to tell if I'm boring you or if you've fallen asleep. So just, just remember that. Um, so about the last two months, we have been journeying our way through the book of Acts. As the writer Luke has detailed the beginning of this Jesus movement, as his followers start to organize and as they struggle through leadership and opposition and the political and cultural chaos that has been stirred up by the life, death and resurrection of this man, Jesus, and this dream that he has left his followers to fulfill. And as we have traced this origin story, we've highlighted some of its main characters, the men and women who found themselves in the middle of something, as Zach might say, right smack in the middle of this new reality, this time in history after the resurrection, when now new things are possible, new ways of being and believing and relating to God are now possible. And this group of believers is now having to navigate the ripple effects of that. And so tonight we're gonna look at another one of these major players. Um, but before we do, I wanna start with a question, which is when's the last time you were wrong? And I mean really wrong. Like the kind of wrong after being absolutely adamant that you were right. Right, when is the last time you were convinced of something, convinced you were right beyond the shadow of a doubt, only to find out that you were horribly mistaken? I, I don't have to look back much farther than last Sunday because marriage, okay? <laughs> this happens to Cole and I uh, quite regularly. Um, so at our place, we've got a, a one car garage and maneuvering the curved driveway uh, in the Honda Pilot is a bit, uh, takes some skill and the muscle memory that I've developed over the last four years of living there. It's taken that long to master. So all this to say, parking for us can be a little bit dicey. So last Sunday, I'm in a rush to get out of the house and I am backing up the car and I hear this loud crack. And I have run over, I mean directly over, the plastic tub of dog food. And now it's cracked all the way in half. There's dog food all over the garage. And immediately, I mean within an instant, I am convinced that this happened because Cole drove the pilot last and he parked too close to the left side of the garage. I mean, this is the only way that this could have happened, right? Because I would never do this. I would never park too close to that side of the garage. So Cole hears the commotion and he you know, appears out of the house to like see the damage. And immediately I start in with, why did you park so close? And oh my gosh, right? And I'm like starting to yell at him. And he's like, Lindsay, what are you talking about? Like we drove my car all weekend. So you were the last one to drive the pilot. I don't know why you're yelling at me, right? But I was so sure. I was so sure that he was the one that had pulled in way too close. So pretty quickly, I realized that I'm wrong. This whole scenario is my fault. And I kind of start laughing because of just how absurd I'm being. Um, Cole didn't think it was as funny because <laughs> he was the one you know, being yelled at and, and I guess that's fair. Um, I also think about the time at my old office that I was convinced someone had stolen my lunch. I, I made up a memory of the Sprouts plastic bag that I used to pack my lunch in sitting in the passenger seat of my car. And I marched around the whole office looking for someone eating out of the Tupperware that I also own, only to find out that when I got home, my lunch was sitting there on the counter waiting for me where I forgot it. Right? I mean, Deluge, I was so wrong after being so sure that I was right. And I know these things make me look like a monster <laughs> and I am choosing to tell you them and that I believe you're good people and you won't judge me too harshly um, because I bet you have a moment like this of your own. I, maybe you have a moment more like my friend uh, Lauren's. So she grew up in Michigan and she doesn't wear it super obviously, uh, only every so often when she says things like calendar. 
And I can't really remember exactly how this came up, but she was trying to describe what she was calling a door wall to us. And this was clearly something that we all should have been able to understand. They were very common. And I was so lost because I've never heard of a door wall in my life, right? And she was growing very frustrated with my confusion. And the whole time, Lauren had been talking about a sliding door, a sliding door, folks. For 24 years, she lived her life as if this was true, right? Because her parents and her friends and everybody in her world in Brighton, Michigan had told her so. And it wasn't until she bumped into the rest of us, right, that she is coming to this conclusion that this is just something my parents told me, right? And parents, you do this. You do this a lot, right? I know you do because we know, right, that you make up things. Like the ice cream truck does not play music when they're out of ice cream. It actually works the opposite way, right? And it will be earth shattering for your children when they realize this because they have lived their whole life believing it was true, right? So th those are some real, right, but just silly examples. So let's make it a bit more personal. Okay, when's the last time you were wrong about someone? Right, when you had made up your mind about who someone was, right? you had decided you had, you had figured them out and you were right, only to find out that you had judged them a little too harshly and quickly. Right? Or the worst happens and you actually enjoy and like this person <laughs> that you were destined right, to despise. Or maybe you thought you were, you were just doing the right thing by, by confronting that friend. Or you were just doing what you thought was best, right? But it caused a world of hurt for someone that you care about. I've been there very recently. But let's take it even a step further. When is the last time you were wrong about God? When's the last time you were confronted with an idea or, or a belief or, or something you were so sure was true about God or his plans, right? To find out that it wasn't true at all, that maybe you'd misread or you'd been misinformed, right? This is a spot that I've been in many, many times and a spot that I've been in for the last year as I've pursued grad school. And so I know it can be intense and scary and it's shattering these conceptions of God that I have walked around holding for a very, very long time. And so I know this business about being wrong, right? Admitting that we didn't have it all right, whether it's about who parked the car too close to the garage or whether it's about who God is, it's difficult to admit. And so in those moments that I asked you to remember, right? When you were vehemently sure, right, of something that actually turned out to be wrong, how did you respond? Right, defensively, maybe a little threatened or insecure. I mean, I'm no psychologist, but I bet that we respond poorly because we're scared of what being wrong means for us, right? Because if I was wrong about that, well, then what else might I have missed? And if I was wrong about that, right, can you trust me? Can I trust myself? If I was wrong about that, does that make me dumb or stupid, right? So we fight it or we deny it and we bury it because being wrong, it means too much. And so remembering this, remembering how we have responded, it helps me to understand what these men that we've been looking at, like Stephen and Saul and like Peter, who we're gonna look at tonight, what they were really up against, what they were working to undo as they spread this news about who Jesus truly is and what he can do. And so as we look at the ministry of Peter tonight, I want us to hold in front of us these moments that we've been wrong. Because getting it wrong, it is essential to embracing the way of Jesus, to embracing maturity and your own discipleship. See, getting it wrong is necessary if we're ever gonna hope to get it right. All right, so we have spent the last two weeks talking about Saul turned Paul. And while much of the book of Acts, it centers his experience, Luke, who is authoring this book, is sure to draw our attention to Peter. Shortly after, Saul has this defining moment right on the road to Damascus, which we looked at two weeks ago. So we're going to go back into Acts 9, where we get this little interlude on Peter and what he's up to before the rest of the book moves on to follow Paul's movements that, that we've taken a look at. 
So who is Peter again? Right? Unlike Saul, who is introduced to us in Acts, Peter isn't a new character. We first meet Peter years before this on the beach of the Sea of Galilee when he's fishing with his brother, Andrew. And Jesus approaches him and they have this really curious interaction. Right? At Trey, one of our board members, he taught a whole message on, on just that moment that you can go back to listen to or you can just read it again for yourself if you want. It's in Luke chapter five. But after this infamous day on the beach, Jesus gives Peter's life new direction and new purpose, right? He tells him that you are gonna become a fisher of men, of people, right? Which sounds a little bit strange. And Peter, he he winds up joining Jesus's inner circle as a disciple, not really knowing all that would mean and all that would entail. And then over the next three years, he lives up close to Jesus. And there's a handful of moments that give us this glimpse into what kind of guy Peter was, what he was like, and his evolution, right? His growth as a disciple, right? When he notoriously walked on water. And there was the time that he cut off the soldier's ear when they came to arrest Jesus. And then there was the three times, right, that he denied being Jesus's friend or his follower. And so Peter's track record as a disciple is littered with times that he was wrong, right? When he acted out of passion and Jesus had to explain and re-explain over and over again this new way, right? This new way of being and believing, this kind of backwards, upside down way of his kingdom. And so before the resurrection, Peter was impulsive, and he was stubborn and he was reckless. I would liken him to a character like JJ from Outer Banks. He, he's a bit of a wild card. He's kind of rough around the edges, um, but he's loyal. Right? And he's full of potential if you just point him in the right direction. All right, Gen Z, that one was for you. For everybody else who's like, I have no idea what you're saying. I, you could liken Peter maybe to someone like Tony Stark. And it's not a perfect parallel, but he's likable and he's charismatic right? But he's stubborn and he's hard-headed and he's usually problematic, right? But there's this evolution in Peter after the resurrection, right? And it's not that the Holy Spirit dulled or erased Peter's passion or his charisma, but we see that what was in Peter all along is actually refined, right? So he goes from being impulsive to decisive, to a confident leader, right, for the early church, And he goes from being brash and and brazen to being this bold teacher and speaker. And so we see that with the spirit alive in Peter, he continues to be transformed. And when we hear of him again in Acts, Peter still has not arrived, right? He has not made it, right? So when Luke picks up with him at the end of Acts 9, Peter has been traveling around from place to place and he's healed a few people and he's now, he's settled and he's landed in this town on the coast called Joppa. And we're now gonna jump into Acts chapter 10, verse one. So in Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, right? Also, that name is incredible. Like I love that his name is Cornelius. It's so epic. He was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a a devout, God-fearing man, And as was everyone in his household, he gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. So just a few things to note here, okay? Caesarea is about 32 miles north of Joppa, okay? So on the map, we have Jerusalem, which is where the resurrection happened. And so Peter has made his way up to Joppa there. And now we have this Roman captain, right, Cornelius, up in Caesarea, And it is the largest, the most important city on the Mediterranean, right, in Palestine. It's this key strategic zone for the Roman military power that they are now in possession of. And it's here where we meet Cornelius. And he's a Roman centurion, so he is a commander of 100 other soldiers, right? But the way that Luke describes Cornelius is actually a bit surprising, Right, we see in his description of this man that it's kind of this deviation away from the script that we might tend to think of when we hear Roman soldier. Right, so even though right, he represents this position of oppression right, of the state, but Cornelius isn't a brute and he's not cruel. 
But we find out that he's a devout man, meaning he prayed regularly. He observed Jewish holidays and their rituals, and he was generous. And he took good care of the people in his city. So in fewer words, Cornelius is a man on a journey. Right? He had come to start seeking God during his time away from Rome while he's been stationed in Israel. And while he doesn't have all of the answers, right, his life begins to show evidence of this earnest search right, for the divine, for God, right, for something more. And so an angel appears to Cornelius, which is spooky, very spooky anytime that happens. And he tells him to send word for this man named Simon Peter, who has been living in Joppa. And so the next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. And in the sheet were, were all sorts of animals and reptiles and birds. And then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord. And so Peter discerns this voice as God. Right? No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times and then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. And so Peter wakes up and he's dazed and he's confused and he's trying to figure out what in the world that was all about, right? And Cornelius's men, they're approaching, right? They are at the gate and they explain, right? There was this angel and there's this message to look for this guy, Simon Peter, and we're supposed to inv invite you back to Cornelius's house. Right? And it's at this point that Peter is starting to put some of the pieces together. And this was not just, you know, the most bizarre fever dream he's ever had, but God is trying to get his attention. Right? So in this dream, there's all of these right, animals and reptiles and birds that Peter is reluctant right, to eat. And well, that would be because according to Jewish law, certain foods were forbidden, right? Culturally, we might be familiar with the rule against eating pork, but there were many of these. There were many rules about what was okay to eat and what was not. And these rules, they made it extremely difficult for Jews to share a meal with Gentiles, with non-Jewish people, because they would be risking, right, defilement. And so if you follow that thought, now Gentiles themselves are being seen as unclean and dirty. And so these laws, they were given to the Israelites a long, long time ago to demonstrate how they are meant to be set apart, how their lives, their actions, their behaviors, they are meant to be set apart from the rest of the world. Right, but this gets distorted. And now these rules are being used to perpetuate this flawed idea that now they're not just set apart, but they are set above. Right? And it creates this, this condemnation and this disgust of the Gentile people in Jewish people. And so upon waking up, Peter is met with a dilemma because accepting this invitation right, from the Roman centurion, it would absolutely mean breaking Jewish law. Right? To associate with him at all, to, to then go to his house and then let alone a share a meal with him, this would mean betraying everything Peter had spent his whole life believing about Gentiles and their separation from God. See, Peter didn't have to be a Pharisee, right, to have adopted ideas about who was allowed to be close to God and who wasn't, right? And before this episode on the roof, Peter believed his ideas about Gentiles were right. He had spent his whole life upholding this belief system, right, that reinforced it. Every Jew he would have ever known would have agreed with him. And, and Peter had just spent the last few years of his life, right, as one of Jesus' closest disciples. And even that hadn't uprooted some of these religious and cultural ideas about who the grace of Jesus is for and who the work on the cross actually covers. Right, but Peter was wrong. Peter was wrong. 
And God replays this vision three times in order to wake Peter up to this idea that he'd gotten all wrong about who gets to belong and who doesn't. And so imagine what that might have felt like then for Peter after being so passionately sure that he was right to realize he was wrong about grace. He was wrong about excluding this group of people he thought were unworthy. He was wrong about thinking that he was more entitled to a relationship with God. I don't think that can be understated, right? The weight of that moment. And here's what I wanna emphasize. Peter doesn't simply just change his mind and leave it at that. I love how Zach explained this a few weeks ago, that true repentance isn't just deciding to think differently, but it moves us to do differently too, right? Repentance and obedience are two sides of the same coin. They're two sides of the same coin. And I know that word obedience feels maybe a little intimidating or or kind of domineering, but it really just boils down to trust, to acting out of trust. So if repentance is to turn away from something that is not true or that is not of God, well, then obedience is to turn towards something that I now know is true, right? And Peter, he didn't simply just change his mind, but it also moved him closer to the people that he had neglected and excluded physically, He accepts the invitation. He makes the journey to Caesarea. Cornelius has invited some of his family and his friends to, to be at this meeting that God has clearly gone to very great lengths to orchestrate. He has sent angels and visions and dreams to make sure that Cornelius can hear whatever the message that Peter is carrying is because it must be important. And so Peter told them, you know it is against our laws. Right, for, for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to even associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone, of anyone as impure or unclean. And so I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. Right? And then Cornelius like goes into the whole thing again, right? He's like, there's an angel. And then I said to summon this guy, Simon Peter. And so I sent my guys and then I invited the neighborhood. And now we're here and we are waiting to hear what this message you have is. And so Peter begins. He says, then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and who do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. There is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. For Jewish people and for Gentile people and for all people of any nation in any place, you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ, who's Lord of all. This is the good news that Peter brought to Cornelius and the people of Caesarea that day, that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Messiah. He is what history and tradition and prophecy have been pointing to the whole time. And he is able to forgive whatever is separating you from God and instead give you peace with God. And the rest of the story reads that those who were listening And those who believed, they also then inherited the Holy Spirit the very same way the disciples did a few chapters before this, right? Signaling and verifying to them that this is the work of Jesus, that this is the very heart of God, right? To reach and to cover every Gentile, every Jew, every man or woman, free or otherwise, with his grace and his forgiveness, bringing them into the family of God forever. And it began with Peter getting it wrong. It began with him getting it wrong, admitting that he had the wrong idea about who God cares for, who grace counted for and who it didn't, about who God wanted to include, about who he was supposed to befriend and get right up close to. 
And so Peter, even in these years after Jesus' death and resurrection, he is still being discipled. He's still being challenged and stretched and brought closer to the heartbeat of Jesus. And the invitation still stands for you and for me today. Whether you have been a Christian for decades or whether you're not really even sure you would, you would call yourself that, we get the same chance to admit we were wrong. We, we had the wrong idea about God or about those people or about grace and about re- belonging. And, and we get to turn away from those old stale ideas and we get to turn towards the gospel of Jesus and the very people that we have spent so much time avoiding because we decided they were messy or dirty or difficult or whatever. The question then tonight becomes, not just what have we been wrong about, but who, who have we been wrong about? I want us to consider very specifically, who have we excluded from belonging? Who have we been neglecting in our prayers or in our friendships or in our relationships? Which groups of people have we written off as unwanted or unworthy or hostile because tradition or our parents or culture told us so? Who have we been wrong about? And then what might it look like not to simply just change our our mind or think differently about them, right? But to embrace true repentance, the kind of repentance that's coupled with this obedience, this acting out of trust and taking a step closer in proximity, taking a step closer in relationship to the very people we got wrong. And it's likely, I think what you might find is that whatever person or group or community that you're thinking of right now, they might already be seeking God in their own way. That's what we see in this story of Peter and of Cornelius. That Cornelius was already pursuing spirituality. He just didn't have the whole picture yet. He was missing some crucial pieces about Jesus that God used Peter to fill in for him. This reveals to me that wherever God might tell you or me or us to go, he's already been there. He has already been moving and working ahead of me and independently, but uh, he does this beautiful thing where he invites me to play a part in it. So who have you been wrong about? I see getting it wrong, that is evidence of the work of the spirit in our life, right? Revealing the things that we've held onto that are not of Jesus and that are getting in the way of people belonging to the family of God. And then it is the work of us, right? Not to ignore or or bury or fight off when we might not be right. But instead, let's embrace it. Let's embrace it as a step closer to who Jesus really is. Embrace it as the step closer to the people that Jesus wants to extend his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his freedom and his love to. And what might happen if we do. So Kindred, would you stand? Let's close in prayer together. God, God, thank you for who you are, that you are good. God, that you come after us. God, that you are perfect in your care and your protection and your provision of us. God, I pray tonight that your spirit would do what only it can do. God, which is convict our hearts, maybe reveal, show us, what have we gotten wrong? Maybe because it was told to us that way or we just assumed or we just caught on by osmosis. It doesn't matter how we came to that conclusion, God. But tonight I pray, God, you'd show us a better way, a new way, God. God, I pray that you would make us bold, that you'd make us courageous and brave enough to admit when we got some idea of you and who you care about and how this whole God, God salvation and grace thing works. I pray you'd help us to see we got it wrong and make us brave enough to admit, to admit that. 
God, and then make us the kind of people who in repentance turn away from that, God, and in obedience turn towards you, turn towards Jesus, and it actually moves us to do something different than we've done before. God, I ask that you make us those kind of people and that you would make us that kind of church. Jesus, we love you and I need you. In your name I pray, amen.